As we look at the back of the media's performance in 2015, no journalist had a greater and more humiliating fall than Brian Williams, who lost his job as NBC anchor for telling his false story about coming under fire on a chopper in Iraq a dozen years ago. Did you know it was not true? I told the story correctly for years before I told it incorrectly. I was not trying to mislead people. ISIS faded from the radar for much of the year until the attacks in Paris and then in San Bernardino prompted the media to demand answers in the war against terror. I guess the question is, and if you'll forgive the language, it is why can't we take out these bastards? Well, Jim, I just, I just spent uh, the last three questions answering that very question. Uh, so I don't know what, what more you want me to add. News organizations faced a real challenge in covering allegations of police misconduct and urban violence, which was vividly on display when Baltimore exploded. If you look over here, you can just get a sense of how the police, though, are still very passive, Megan. We saw that yesterday. The question now is whether the police actually end up starting back at this. We're going to Megan. We're going to go send it back to you. And joining us now, Mercedes Schlapp, a U.S. News columnist, political consultant, and former aide in the Bush White House, and Michelle Cottle, a contributing editor to The Atlantic. Looking back at the history, the year of tension between the police and the black community, urban violence, uh, racial tension, which exploded in Baltimore, do you think the media have played a divisive role? That whole area. You know, I think to a certain degree they have played a divisive role. It's almost like they've pitted the cops against the African American community. Obviously, we saw the very, you know, very difficult images in Ferguson and Baltimore. Um, but again, at the same time, I think these are inc incredible issues, important issues to be able to talk about and have the dialogue uh, because of the fact that there's so much going on in the African-American community and also in law enforcement trying to figure out their role. When you turn on cable TV during one of these conflagrations, um, it's almost like a lot of the commentators have to pick sides. Well, no, the police are being treated unfairly. Well, no, these guys are thugs and we shouldn't have any sympathy for them. And, of course, you know, the narrative in the Michael Brown story turned out to be wrong. But Baltimore, nobody was expecting what happened after Freddie Gray. And uh, suddenly reporters are on the front lines and it's dangerous. Absolutely, and these issues had been brewing for a long time. And the thing about these issues is the imagery with them is often very dramatic. You know, you have people out in the streets, you have cops and dead bodies, and all of these things just make for a story that's kind of inherently overheated. And do the presence of television cameras sometimes attract the thugs and the troublemakers and maybe, just maybe, uh, add to the potential for violence? Oh, sure. I mean, this is everybody's opportunity to get their sides heard, but you also then have people who come in looking to cause trouble or kind of just inflammatory rhetoric when a situation is so very delicate to begin with. Right, and, and a lot of times the law enforcement don't get to get their side, don't have their side heard. Why? Because a lot of the, these cops they have to stay quiet from a legal perspective, right? They're not allowed to talk if they were involved in this, in the, in the incident. So it really becomes almost a one-sided story when you're not, for when the, the cops that were involved can't even tell their story. It does bother me when there's an assumption uh, that the police are at fault in these shootings. And in other times with the video services, and we see that actually uh, it was excessive force or cold blooded murder in some cases. And you wonder how the story would play differently if there wasn't some citizen cell phone video. Yeah, and, and you have this immediate reaction. I mean, you don't have time for the full story to come out in a lot of these cases. You don't have time for people to go back and review exactly what happened or whether there was excessive force or whether the stories that are being told are exactly, you know, as they have been rumored to be because it's immediate. The, you know, you have 24-hour cable going all the time, and they need the reaction, and they're going to grab anybody who's right there, and it just makes it all. And they're going to grab the emotional individuals, the parents, the family members. I mean, it really, yeah. it really tugs at your Everybody's heart. Everybody's tuning exactly. in when this happens. Uh, similar questions about terrorism. Now, the press really turned on President Obama, in my view, after the Paris attacks, when he didn't seem to sort of understand the fear and anxiety. And then, of course, San Bernardino. Um, but for most of this year, until those attacks, terrorism had really kind of slipped off the media radar to a large degree. Well, I think there was a lot of coverage when you saw the beheadings of Americans or, or Europeans. Yes, saturation that, coverage. That was, was a saturation horrifying. coverage. Horrifying. And then all of a sudden, 
the conversation just changed. And it did change to the, again, the, the, the what was happening in Ferguson, what was happening. So these sort of local situations. It changed to the campaign, yes, exactly. to Donald Trump, to all kinds of controversies. So I just wonder, you know, we all... Journalists then ask the question, what did the administration do? Why hasn't there been a more sustained effort? Um, but I think to some extent well, we're also guilty of um, a short attention span. Oh, absolutely. And unless there is an immediacy, foreign policy tends to fall off the radar, especially because that's not what really gets you know, viewers worked up a lot of the time, un unless something dramatic is happening. And then, of course, it becomes the most important thing. Right. But I also would argue that the White House has failed to really deliver a strong message. And, and and basically push the media to say, okay, this is our, you know, we're fighting against terrorism in a strong way and doing X, Y, Z. It really um, has, you know, we saw that with that press conference that the president had, uh, where it was very much about uh, he, he came he across defensive he kept and, about the and he was complaining about the questions. And but it was even, and that's whether that's true or not, whether the administration has not been able to drive any kind of coherent message on terrorism, isn't it the media's responsibility to stay on the case about ISIS and national security, uh, whether or not politicians are talking about it? And some do, certainly. And some do, the beat reporters, absolutely. But this is always the issue. Is Are reporters going to tell people what they want to hear, or are reporters going to tell people what they need to know? Right. The biggest media meltdown involving a famous celebrity, new celebrity, was of course Brian Williams losing his job as NBC anchor. Um, do you ever feel you got an adequate explanation from him as to why he told the lies and engaged in the exaggerations he did about being on the helicopter in Iraq and other stories he's covered? You know, I don't feel I did, and, and partly is looking at the Today interview that he did following the ins having to resign. He basically said, "Oh, I, it was I, it was torture." Like he he was trying to get the sympathy card from the viewers, and it's like, "Well, wait a second, you fabricated these stories. Why, why, why?" And then we never really got to the bottom of it. As somebody who's known Brian Williams for a long time, I've never fully been able to understand a guy who was absolutely on top of his career, on top of the game, number one nightly news anchor, why he would do this. But I'm also kind of glad that he's gotten a second chance to be the breaking news anchor at MSNBC and that his career wasn't ended by this. Yeah, you don't want something like this to completely wipe out all of the years of good work that he did. I mean, there was a lot of schadenfreude, apparently, among people who thought he'd gotten too big for his britches in certain sectors. Uh, but He didn't you know, seem to inspire the loyalty of the rank and file within NBC. There was a lot of exactly. leaking and people who were not that uh, unhappy to see him lose the anchor purge. Um, but his, remember, he, he initially tried to sort of give like a 40-second apology and just get back to work. That didn't fly and I, I don't think that that can fly anymore can it? No I, th I think you really have to kind of do some public soul searching everybody wants you to do your kind of public mea culpa we've learned this from politicians and then maybe if you do it sufficiently you can go back and kind of get your redemption people love a good redemption story they do except for politicians that never get the redemption story <laughs> well, there's been politicians who've come oh, back right? oh, do you think that the politicians are treated more harshly I would say so I think it's harder for them to come back and and, and have the redemptive story. On that note, Michelle Connell, Mercedes Schlapp, thanks very much for joining us.